some history with the waters over here in um, Western Illinois, but today I'll share with you um, a little bit about uh, recreational kayaking. So as we get started, I think I'm going to turn off my video to save some bandwidth so that everyone um, I can make sure we get through this um, without any technical difficulties, uh, but I wanted to say hello before I turn off my video. So today's goals, oh, I thought I was gonna have a technical problem already, but my goals today um, for you and I are really to share the science um, that supports the benefits of kayaking uh, review the basics of recreational kayaking in Illinois, briefly explore stream ecology, and inspire you, hopefully, to take action. And to meet those goals, we're going to talk about the different types of paddle sports, talk about what is flat water kayaking and why should we do it, the eco-psychological benefits of nature associated with aquatic environments, kayaking in Illinois we're going to cover, cover a little bit of kayaking safety, things we can do on a kayak, and then a short tour of plants, wildlife, and habitats um, that we can see on a kayak, and a brief Q&A at the end. So you probably hear people talk about paddling, or I love paddling, or I'm into paddle sports. There are three main paddle, popular paddling sports, kayaking, Canoeing and mo more recently popularized stand up paddle boarding or SUP. Um, today, obviously, we're going to talk about kayaking. We're going to focus in on kayaking, but I wanted to mention a little bit about canoeing and, and um, stand up paddle boarding. boarding. Uh, a canoe actually dates even further back than a kayak. 10,000 years ago, indigenous peoples used dugout canoes um, hollowed out from trees for the transportation of goods and services or excuse me, goods and people. A canoe uh, uses a single bladed paddle, as you can see in front of you, um, a little drawing at the bottom, versus in kayaking using a double bladed paddle. Uh, canoe is usually guided by two people. And then we have stand up paddle boarding, which has its roots in Africa, South America, and ancient Polynesia in the 16th century. Uh, the paddler, which is a very cute little paddler there, that is my daughter, um, stands on a large board about 10 to 12 feet, uses a long single bladed paddle, and in 2013, which is 10 years ago already, um, was named one of the fastest growing new sports. So what is flat water kayaking? Well, it is a type of recreational kayaking and it's just what it says, paddling a kayak on calm waters. This could be a pond, small lake, a bay, a slow moving river. Um, most of the rivers in Illinois at normal levels are classified either one or two. And we're talk we'll talk about um, river classifications later. Today, we won't be discussing whitewater kayaking or kayaking large rapids, swift moving water, large waves, strong winds, extremely cold water, um, or heavy boat traffic. We're going to stick with um, our flat water glass-like recreational kayaking. So a kayak is a narrow watercraft powered by hand using a double-bladed paddle, um, obviously a non-motorized mode of or travel on water. Uh, kayaks were used by indigenous people um, in the areas of northern North America, Siberia, and Greenland uh, as far back as 4,000 years ago. So canoes 10,000 years ago, kayaks 4,000 years ago, and mainly they were used for hunting and fishing. So obviously the profile of a kayak is down lower. Um, they needed a lot more uh, maneuverability to make quick movements in order to hunt and fish. Um, kayaks are usually smaller and lighter than canoes. They don't carry as much cargo or as many people, obviously. Um, the seat is closer to the hull uh, with backrests, which are very important if you're kayaking long distances. Uh, your legs are extended out in front of you versus a kayak where you're either sitting on a bench or you are um, kneeling on a bench up, up higher on an elevated um, seat. 
There is dry storage available in kayaks, whereas in a canoe, you usually have open storage. So one really cool thing about recreation or, or flat water kayaking is that you can pick up the maneuvering and, uh, quickly. You can pick it up quickly. Once you, get, once you figure out how to get into your kayak, of course, sometimes that can be tricky, um, you can pick up the strokes and pick up how to um, steer your kayak very, very quickly. Another great thing about kayaking is that it's relaxing, right? In fact, kayaking has been shown to be healing and therapeutic. And I wanted to share with you today some of the science behind kayaking in nature and how extremely healthy it can be for you. So an example, right before 2020, a researcher uh, from Europe named Matthew White conducted a study of 20,000 people and he found that people who spent two hours a week in green spaces, so that could be your local park um, or any other natural environment, um, either all at once or spread out over several visits, were, were more likely to report good health and psychological well-being than those who don't. Um, and they found that that 120 minutes, that two hours per week was a hard line. Anything under that two hours a week um, did not, those folks did not report um, positive health outcomes. So that's that sweet spot. So that's that goal for you is to spend time outside at least two hours per week um, and become immersed into the outdoors. So let's see how kayaking can do that for us. So we're talking about the science of kayaking and the benefits that it brings to you. So the field of study um, that encompasses these various treatment models in the natural environment is called eco-psychology. Um, it treats the environment as a source of healing for individuals. And it was founded by a man named Theodore Rozak. He was actually born in Chicago. Um, there are a couple different assumptions that come with the field of eco-psychology. Number one, um, our modern people are disconnected more and more from the natural world. And this becomes an indicator for psychological illnesses like anxi anxiety, depression, um, increased stress, uh, interpersonal conflict, and two, reconnection to that natural world, whether it be um, uh, interfacing with plants and animals or gardening, walks in nature, that actually, that reconnection reduces those symptoms of isolation, reduces symptoms of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. Researchers also found that humans are bonded to the natural environment almost exactly the same way that they're bonded to family and friends. So ecotherapy, which actually is an emerging field out of ecopsychology, um, approaches this by trying to develop and reestablish that quality relationship with ecology. Um, so that's, that's, it's really deep stuff right there, but that, that is, um, increasing and more and more research is being done in this world of um, nature benefiting us and our health. Um, the University of Illinois actually, um, through the uh, Landscape and Human Health Lab, Dr. Quo, they're continuing to study these interactions and how nature can improve health. And what they came up with was there is one of the ways that um, nature improves health is through specific environmental conditions. So trees and plants. So specifically, if you break it really far down into the um, science, plants give off chemicals. They're actually antimicrobial anti compounds that are shown to reduce blood pressure and boost our immune system to fight out long-term disease. Trees actually reduce heat, which there in turn reduces heat-related illnesses. They also clean air, we know all of these things, but to put this together in science is, is actually pretty fascinating. But trees clean air and alleviates respiratory illnesses and heart attacks. Now, moving on to moving water, 
when there is that moving water bouncing off uh, rocks, it's creating these negative ions and microorganisms in the air that reduce depression and also boost our immune system. And sight, the sights and sounds of nature. Um, people who view images of nature or are out in nature have a reduction in their sympathetic nervous activity. That's your fight or flight uh, response. And then an increase in your parasympathetic activity, which is which relaxes the nerves after stress. Um, the sounds of nature. So I put a bluebird here, right? Because we can go out and we can hear the birds singing. I actually heard someone log on earlier and I could hear the birds singing in their background. Um, but those sounds have been proven to increase parasympathetic activation again. So bringing on those hormones that are, that are reducing um, uh, and relaxing after stress. So in the end, these have very, very positive long-term long health outcomes, uh, preventing illness and creating fac faster healing. And you can see that a lot of times in um, nursing ha homes or long-term care units, um, using nature, trying to bring in nature to those um, folks. So those are our environmental conditions. Now, physiological effects of being outside and being outside on the water. Um, increases your anti-cancer -can NK cells. Um, those NK cells protect us against cancer, viral infections, other negative issues. Um, it decreases the levels of inflammatory proteins that lead to diabetes. It decreases our blue blood group glucose levels. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me, I'm sorry, our blood glucose levels that cause kidney and ner nerve damage. And it also decreases, decreases our stress hormones, which um, allows us to have improved sleep and higher metabolism. Our psychological effects. So now we're talking about how does it, how does it work on the brain? Um, researchers have scanned brain activity and um, folks that are in, on, near, or underwater in a safe atmosphere reports um, that they are in a state of calmness, peacefulness, unity, um, uh, short-term well-being. Um, I we also are. Um, I'm sorry, I had somebody come in. A nonprofit um, group in um, Dallas, Texas, actually, um, has a nonprofit program where they are healing um, trauma through kayaking. So they are, they are um, providing a safe and relaxing environment for veterans. Those individuals gain a sense of control and self-reliance. And they found through this program and through research and outcomes that this was the most effective way, kayaking specifically, it was the most effective way to treat and prevent mental illness and, sub and substance abuse. Um, last, there are three more psychological effects um, of kayaking and being outside in nature. Um, there are regular experiences of awe or um, times when you're filled with deep respect um, mixed with wonder. So those, those times when you're out there and you're seeing beautiful scenery, um, uh, increases your, um, immune system functioning, the feelings of enhanced vitality or strength. Um, those also resist, um, infections and have shown this scientifically and last attention restoration. So that helps people when you're out there kayaking, when you're out in nature, it refocuses you and reduces accidents caused by mental fatigue and manages your impulse control that could reduce risky behavior like smoking, overeating, and things like that. So now we've talked a little bit. It sounds simple. It's a simple concept. We've known this for a long time that nature um, helps you, right? Helps you feel healthier. But science is now proving, proving this. Uh, that kayaking in nature makes you healthier. Um, so ecosystems in Illinois, let's transition over to what do we have in Illinois um, that we can um, experience when it comes to aquatic ecosystems and aquatic resources and kayaking. So Illinois has over 300,000 acres of water that's open to the public uh, for recreational purposes. The Illinois State Water Survey um, 
classifies 25 major rivers, and you can see the major watersheds of Illinois right there on your screen. Um, the stream acreage in Illinois, it's very interesting because um, you can see that there's a lot more navigable, um, kayakable, I guess, rivers in, in other areas, but the highest stream acreage is in Western and Southern Illinois, which actually correlates to, you know, where we have the most wooded areas, um, where trees are, are um, you know, found along streams and things like that. So I thought that was interesting. Obviously, the Illinois um, Natural History Survey shows that we have a high level of biodiversity in our streams, over 200 species of fish, 80 species of uh, freshwater mussels, hundreds of aquatic insects, and um, some of them that are of, of greatest concern as far as conservation. Um, I did, um, I'm from Western Illinois, so these water trails are not even near me, except for the Rock River um, and the Quad Cities, but I did select a few major water trails that you can take this and, um, and go explore on your own. Um, we have in, um, it starts out in uh, Wisconsin, ends in the Quad Cities in Illinois. It's our longest uh, water trail that we have in Illinois. We actually have two national water trails, the first one being the Rock River National Water Trail, um, 325 20 miles, 155 access points. The Fabulous Fox National Water Trail, again, another national trail, 158 miles, 70 plus access points. Um, the Vermilion River, the Middle Fork, is actually classified as a National Wild and Scenic River, which is um, great. It's the only one in Illinois. It's 17.1 miles. Um, and then we have uh, the Lower Cache down in Southern Illinois, Embra in Eastern Illinois, and the Lincoln Heritage Water Trail on the Sangamon um, in what I would call Central Illinois from Decatur to Petersburg. Um, the Illinois Paddling Council, and hopefully some of you on here um, are part of the Illinois Paddling Council. Um, and I know I probably have all different types of um, uh, O levels of experience levels on, on this webinar, but uh, the Illinois Paddling Council just released not too many months ago, a really wonderful interactive map um, on where to paddle in Illinois. So visit their website. This is a screenshot of that um, map. Um, it definitely um, shows that there's a lot of information in North and Northeastern Illinois. If you zoom in, you can get really close to, or you can see all the specific access points and all the specific areas where there are um, dams, that sort of thing. Um, they'll also accept input from users out there that are paddling. Um, around Illinois uh, for information about other streams. But this is a really great interactive tool that you can use when you are out there planning your paddling trips. Also, there's a great website for Northeastern Illinois paddling called Paddle Illinois Water Trails, has lots of route instructions and information about put in, take out spots um, and things like that. So check out those two um, tools when you're planning your when you're planning your trips. So we talked about rivers, we talked about streams. Illinois also has um, lots of wetlands and lakes that are public um, that you can um, paddle. Definitely great for beginners. Um, one advantage of paddling wetlands and the lakes are that you do not need a shuttle. You are taking off from one spot and you're coming back to the same spot. So you don't have to arrange for shuttles. Um, this is a picture of Emaquan Nature Preserve in central Illinois. Uh, I was just there with my master naturalist not too long ago, but a great place to go and see uh, all types of plants and, and wildlife. Um, but the slow pace, of course, of a wetland or a lake can slow you down and help you to identify, you be able to identify um, plants and things that are along the shore or in the water. So don't forget and don't um, forget about those wetland areas out there. So what are we going to do and how are we going to find the right spot? What should we look for when we're trying to uh, plan a kayaking outing? Um, first, you want to wait. You want to look for areas that have protection from wind and waves. Look for calm bays, rivers with slow current, 
Um, it has good access spots. Um, lots of times there's lots of streams where you want to get into this stream and you just can't get there because um, there's private lands all around um, those streams. Just do your homework and make sure that, that there are good access spots that are publicly available uh, for the streams or the areas that you want to kayak. Um, it's always awesome and great to make sure that there are places to go ashore and explore. Um, just, you know, areas of interest that, that you get to take a rest and hang out for a while. And then obviously the last point here is just making sure that there's minimal uh, motorized boat traffic. Um, so how do we find those right spots? So we talked about the Illinois Paddling Council, um, interactive map. Um, you can also look for um, your water levels using the US Geological Survey or the USGS water dashboard. Um, the website is right there. You can take a picture of that or write that down real quick, dashboard.waterdata.usgs.gov. Um, this interactive map is really neat and shows all different points in the United States, anywhere you want to look um, for the uh, water levels and the stream discharge. So you can see here, it kind of looks like, I don't know what it kind of looks like, a pizza or something like that, but you can see Illinois, all the different USGS stations that are monitoring that discharge, and they're also monitoring um, the gate, the height, uh, the water levels. So this is, I just picked one of the spots in Illinois um, showing the discharge of this particular stream. So the discharge, you're looking at cubic feet per second. And CFS, a lot of people call it CFS, it generally, generally determines the flow of the river. It's actually the width of the river times the depth of the river times the speed of the river in, in, a, in a second. So it's the volume of water that's coming past this uh, particular meter. So one thing to know about discharge is that it's going to be different for all different rivers. It depends on the width of the river, where that meter is located. Um, it depends on the depth of the river, where that meter is located. So if you're going to a place that over and over and over again, just make sure you're watching um, what that discharge after a big rain event, a heavy rain event, a weather event, um, just looking at what that um, discharge looks like. It could also be different in different spots along the river. So where this meter is with USGS, it could show a specific type of discharge in one area, but then down the river could, could show a different um, uh, discharge me measurement. So keep that in mind, but it's definitely a good tool to use to go find out um, what your river is doing or what your stream is doing. At the bottom here as well, it shows your height, your gauge height and feet um, to your, your river level. So you can see two different really important pieces of data for the stream that you might want to kayak. Classification of rapids. We talked about class one, class two, level one, level two, um, different rivers in Illinois. Um, this is the classification of rapids that is um, uh, created by the American Whitewater Association. So we've got a class A that is lake water. There's no perceptible movement. That we have class one, which is easy, light riffles, clear passages, occasional sandbanks. Um, you know, very, very beginner, beginner water. And then there's class two, uh, moderate, medium, quick water. Um, there is a little bit of maneuvering required in class two. Most of the rivers in Illinois uh, during at, at um, you know, normal levels are going to be your class one or your class two. Now, on the flip side of things, we've got classifications of paddlers. Um, so the Appalachian Mountain Club um, they're actually talking about canoeists, but um, what is your paddling availability? Uh, so you have class A, no familiarity with canoes, kayaks, or paddling. You've never been on one before ever. Then we have class one beginner, class two novice, you know, how um, you can handle your boat. And it continues to go on um, up the different classes. So what I really want you guys to take away is 
that the classification of your rapids plus what your water level and your river flow should equal your paddling ability. Okay, so don't go into a, a class, you know, four waters if your paddling ability is, cl is class one. So just making sure that you're doing enough research to match your ability with the water that you're going into. So types of recreational kayaks. So we talked about the water. Let's talk about a little tiny bit about our equipment. So recreational flat water kayaks, we've got sit inside and sit on top. And your sit inside, um, typical recreational kayak here um, in front of you. This is one that I used at a camp where I taught kiddos how to kayak. Um, very stable. Some of the pros for your sit inside, um, your legs are up into the cockpit there, and you do have some protection from splash, from drip off of your paddle, uh, from waves that might be splashing over. You can use sit inside, uh, maybe if you're going into colder water because of that protection. And a lot of times these um, kayaks are better and quicker at maneuvering. Um, but the cons on the other side um, of a sit inside kayak, they're more difficult to get in and out. Um, you can't just swing your legs around and we'll talk about on, um, those on the next kayak. Um, and if you do happen to flip, over your kayak is going to be swamped. So it takes a lot of energy um, to get that kayak back to um, being water free so you can enjoy your kayaking um, experience. The other type, the sit on top type of kayak, um, pros of these, you can see your legs are exposed. Um, so you are, uh, it is easy to get in and out. Um, you have less confinement. They do have scupper holes that are self-draining. So if you do happen to, to turn it over, uh, they do drain out. These are more um, uh, oh favorable for when you have maybe kids who want to kayak. Um, warm water, if you're kayaking in warm water because you are gonna get some, uh, get wet. Um, if your kids or you want to get up on and off of your boat and swim and get out in the water, um, the, these types of kayaks are good for those situations. Cons, on the other hand, if, on the other hand, you will get wet, and you have a little less maneuverability with a sit-on-top um, kayak. Safety. So can't go through um, talking about kayaking without talking about safety. Um, obviously, required life jacket always when you're out there kayaking. Um, an audio device, I have a little whistle on um, my kayak um, so that if you do need some help or if there is an emergency, someone can find you. Um, and then filing a float plan. Um, I just put a screenshot of part of the float plan form that the U.S. Coast Guard posts on their website. Um, but this, it doesn't have to be this um, detailed, but this gives you a great um, starting place on uh, how to file a float plan, just tell somebody, you know, where you're going to go, where you're going to put in, where you're going to take out, how long do you think it's going to take you, who's with you, um, those types of things. So if you're ever going to go on a longer, longer term float, just make sure you, you uh, fill this out, fill this float plan out, give it to somebody that's not with you and um, they can check in on you. Um, some additional safety tips here. Obviously, I'm just going to say this twice, wear your um, life jacket. Um, dress to swim. So if it's, um, if you're in a very uh, oh, cold water area, you're going to wear a um, wetsuit, right? If you're in a warm water area, you just want to make sure that you have um, proper clothing on so that if you do get wet, that you will be able to um, be okay out in the air. If you're inexperienced, stay close to the shore. So if you do um, go overboard, you can swim to shore and fix yourself up and fix your boat. And always, always, always watch for uh, your changing, changing weather. So if we're on a flowing water river, a little bit more safety um, when you're reading the water. So learn 
once before you get out there and and as you get more and more experience learn to read the river watch what the river is doing watch the stream dynamics um, and continuously plan your route as you're as you're floating along what how are you going to maneuver through maybe different um, hazards um, obstructions um, you know different things like that how will you plan your route during every single portion of um, of the river. Some common river hazards, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, low head dams, strainers, and uh, foot, foot traps. So this is just a very simple sketch uh, of river hazards that you might see on a you know, stream. On the left-hand side, you can see wing dams. Those um, typically are, are not showing, but when water levels are low, they can show, but tr it keeps the um, channel from uh, uh, going down the middle of the, the riverbed, I guess. Um, those can be obstructions just to keep your eye on. Um, coming around the bend, you can see that this down tree, also called a strainer, um, those are obstructions that just kind of like your pasta strainer, right? The water goes through and everything else doesn't go through. Um, so the water's flowing through them, um, but it can strain your, you and your boat, right? So these obstructions are definitely ones that you need to try to avoid, especially if there's swift water, um, coming through. So again, learning to read, learning to look in ahead of you and to maneuver around um, those types of things. Strainers can be very, very dangerous, especially in that swift water. If your, your kayak gets a little bit tipped over, water can rush in, flip you over. Um, so those are definitely things to keep an eye out on. Um, strainers, they don't have to be trees. They could be any other underwater kind of unseen um, obstruction where the water continues to go through um, but your boat, your boat, or you can't make it through. Um, then coming around, you can see different boulders, a small little rapid here in the middle. Um, just if there are swift, I wanted to talk a little bit about foot traps. If there, if you um, happen to tip over, flip out of your boat, and there is swifter water than normal um, floating along. Uh, with your feet up and waiting till you're in slower moving water would be best so that you're not putting your foot down in those boulders and, and getting that trap, getting your foot trapped underneath there. Um, again, we're trying to stick with flat water, so we shouldn't in class one or two um, rivers be seeing too much um, of, you know, swift water rapids. So we're going down at the bottom of this screen at the, um, uh, you can see a larger boulder or what I hopefully that looks like a boulder to you. It was my very simple sketch, but um, the boulder is there. The water is pushing up against this boulder, creating this pillow. They call it a pillow of water in front of the rock or the boulder. Um, and these are areas too where a boat can get pinned up um against this larger boulder so things to look for um, typically an eddy or circular water motion will occur after one of those large boulders um, and then we're coming down you see the river kind of or the stream kind of gets constricted the flow gets a lot faster and we see a low head dam here and low head dams are really one of those the most extremely dangerous um, obstructions or hazards that you can see in a um, stream and constantly looking out for low head dams should be on your radar at all at all times or even not even or but planning for what you're going to do and where those low head dams are located at before you get out there on the water. Um, you can see after in the next slide, I'll show you a little bit more about low head dams. But after that um, low head dam, you have some some rapid or not some rapids, but some white water. Um, we have a sandbar, some stump fields. Those are just little um, hazard areas that that to look for when you're out there on your kayak. 
Um, the Illinois Paddling Council the, and the ACA, the American Canoe Association, put together a nice little brochure about low head dam safety. You can see there in the middle that after uh, the water flows over top of a low head dam, it creates this kind of washing machine effect. And it it will pull you and your boat down under the water and it's very, very difficult to get out of that turbulence. So low head dams need to be avoided at all times. Plan for areas where you can portage um, your kayak around any and all dams. Please note too that not all dams are marked. Um, so just, just make sure that you do your research um, before you go out there on your kayak. And doing your research, we talked about USGS, we talked about Illinois Paddling Council, but, but um, finding friends that experience kayakers or others that have, have kayaked those rivers or those streams before is something that's, that's invaluable. So if you have clubs, uh, kayaking or canoeing clubs near you, um, seek those folks out. They have a wealth of knowledge. Also, um, there are social media groups that you can, if you're on social media, uh, they have kind of communities on there that uh, people post, uh, you know, where they've scouted different streams, if there was down, or if there were down trees, or if the streams were clear, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and you can contact those folks and, and ask questions. So just that community of kayakers and knowledge can help you um, to have a better kayaking experience. So safety, we've talked about safety. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the fun things that we can do on our kayak. So obviously we talked about the science behind you know relaxation, the benefits um, of kayaking. But we know that relaxation time, you know, spent alone or with, with your family and friends is part of your kayaking experience. Fishing has becoming, has become very, very popular. Um, fishing kayaks um, can access water um, that, you know, motorized boats can't, can't um, access. So fishing via kayak has, has, is becoming more and more popular. Photography, um, kayaking is a great way to um, to practice your photog your nature photography um, skills. Birding, I just put a. I'm hope that all of you um, uh, use the Merlin Bird ID app, or I guess any other bird ID app that you can use. But I just put a screenshot up here of when I was over. I was in Missouri actually. And, um, you know, just a listing of different birds that we were hearing just in that one um, 27 second period of time when we were out kayaking, it was just um, really amazing. And just exploration and observation, it brings out the kid in us, right? We want to see what's around the bend. We want to um, explore and, and see what's up next and see if there's any uh, interesting sights to see or sneak up on wildlife or that sort of thing. So those are things that that's the fun, the, the fun part that allows us to, you know, take some of those risks and prepare ourselves for all the, the safety risks that could be out there, um, but have a lot of fun and create a lot of meaningful experiences. So kayaking can be a treasure hunt. The slower pace of kayaking allows us time to notice um, different things that you wouldn't notice if you're in a motorized boat or for just like taking a walk or backpacking or hike, hiking. You see a lot more uh, details in nature um, when you're on a kayak. So stream habitats. So I want to talk a little bit about stream microhabitats. Um, and, and how to read the water. So when we're exploring different things, we want to see different uh, wildlife. We want to see different, um, uh, you know, plants and things like that. There are four major types of flowing water and we're when we're talking about habitats. We talked about, you know, the level of water when we're kayaking, but this is more of like where our organism is going to be found. Where is our wildlife and our fish going to be found? So Four different types of flowing water. We have a riffle. So a riffle is our areas that are food factories of a stream. 
Um, they have moderate flows over a cobbly, I don't know if that's a word, but a kind of a, a rough bottom um, substrate in your stream. There is some vegetation, small phytoplankton or small teeny tiny plants that are feeding those secondary index, insects, which are then in turn feeding your fish. So these four major types of water are all as a result of different physical characteristics of a stream or a river. The gradient or the slope of your riverbed determines how fast the water flows. The substrate on the bottom determines how turbulent the flow is gonna be or like how much oxygenation is, oxygenization is happening um, in that water. And then the depth um, of the water is determining whether or not that turbulence um, if it's hitting different rocks and things like that, it, the depth is going to determine whether that um, turbulence reaches the surface. So we have a riffle, so which is, like I said, shallow with a rough bottom food factory. We have a run. This is a little bit deeper than a riffle. A little bit less flow, but we do find some insects, aquatic insects in the runs. We have a pool, which is even deeper water. There's a just a tiny bit of flow. Um, usually very deep over the over six foot. Um, the light penetration doesn't get down into that um, pool very far. So there's not a lot of vegetation or green things that use photosynthesis. Um, but this is where you're going to find a lot of your larger fish because it is cooler in those areas um, and you're going to find those larger fish. And last, we have a flat. These are your still water areas, really wide sections of the river where it feels like there is no current whatsoever, has a glass-like surface, surface, and that's where your fish are out there uh, feeding. So this um, illustration, it's kind of uh, fuzzy, but it shows, again, kind of that same uh, stream, but it shows the different micro habitats. So we see riffles, we see pools maybe on the outsides of bends. Um, we see a run that kind of connects the pool with the riffle. And then you see a riffle that's, that's um, running over top of those um, boulders. So you can see kind of the different habitats just in this little tiny um, area of the stream. So when you're out on your kayak, look for those areas, look at the stream dynamics that you can see and that'll tell you whether or not you're gonna find some of these um, critters that you're looking for. So kayak wildlife. So I love mussels um, and I love finding places where mussels are at. Um, they, mussels are like the filters of our water, right? They are the cleaners of our water. Um, in Illinois, we have 80 species of mussels um, originally, and that's what all the literature says. But in actuality, only 59 of those species um, have been found since 1970. So we're a little bit worried about the population of um, these mussels. But I have a few pictures here that I took on the left. Um, you can see um, the in-current and ex-current siphon tubes of this mussel. Um, it's really kind of cool how you can see the details of like the little fingers of the siphon, siphon tubes. It's really crazy because if you're floating over top of these, or if you put your hand and you kind of make a shadow that goes over top of these, um, they'll, you can see the siphon tubes close up. Um, so they can sense, I guess, that, that movement or that, I don't know, it's just, it's, you know, one of the fascinating parts of um, of nature. On the right hand side, the kind of bigger picture, you can see all the trails. We're floating over this area and you can see kind of the trails that these mussels make. You know, they have their foot that they extend out and they pull in and they pull themselves around, especially when water levels are changing. And you can see, and I don't know if you can see my, um, my mouse, but you can see these trails of where mussels have been moving in this clear water. So it really, really kind of a neat, neat thing to see. Uh, mussels, of course, have a really interesting life cycle. Um, the male and the female must be nearby. Some of them are hermaphroditic, so they have both male and female parts. 
Um, but the eggs are fertilized by the male. Um, they become larvae and they're pushed out into the stream and they attach to different host fish, the, um, the gills of host fish. Um, and they latch onto those, the gills of the fish and um, grow in there and then release themselves um, once they're grown. And some um, mussel species have specific host fish. So they'll kind of, they have lures sometimes that they'll put out that looks like a fishing lure and the fish will come over and start nibbling around um, on that. And those, that glochidia, those larvae are then uh, released out into the water that attached to those fish. So that's, I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing that they've survived uh, for this long, but they are our filters. They are very, very sensitive to changes, you know, in the, in the aquatic habitat. Do I have any other mussel lovers on the call? I hope so. <laughs> um, more wildlife, just photos I took uh, of my kayaking adventures. You know, you can see all kinds of wildlife sign out there, wildlife uh, tracks and just different things. Um, in the middle, that's on the left side, in the middle picture, I think I can, if I push this button, I think you'll be able to see a mink come out of these tree roots, if you look really closely. There he is. Just some of those really, really cool moments um, in nature that you don't get to see if you don't get out there on the water and get out there in nature. And then on the right, I have, um, some educational uh, display of some invertebrates that we caught in a wetland area um, that we were doing. I love to take nets out and take my kids out and, and students out and just see the diversity of different macro invertebrates that we can uh, catch out there in the stream, uh, stream habitats. More wildlife, more and more and more. I could go on forever, but on the left, a cliff swallow, um, you can see if you look really, really closely under a bridge, a colony of, of cliff swallow nests. Of course, we've got our state insects, uh, caterpillar there, a monarch caterpillar on some milkweed on the side of the um, stream. And then on the right, I thought this was just really a neat, um, at first I was like, oh my goodness, um, erosion. It's so doesn't look good, but then it actually became really fascinating. You can see the different soil horizons and then you can see different um, wildlife that were using the side of that bank cliff um, as you know different wildlife homes. I better get to moving. I'm running out of time. All right, kayak botany. Um, some of the some of the cool species of flowers that I've seen just the other day, purple rocket on the left-hand side. It's a spring or early summer um, flowering uh, plant. Illinois has over 200 species of plants, over 200. I stopped counting at 200 that can be found in or near aquatic ecosystems. So obviously you have trees, you have um, submerged and emergent aquatic vegetation, you have terrestrial forbs that are along the, the um, stream edges, the banks, um, you have wetland plants, sedges, grasses, shrubs, all different kinds of things. So over 200. So you can go go crazy when you're when you're looking for um, uh, streamside uh, botany or streamside flora. Um, these plants, you know, they're they're really important to our stream environments. They're providing shade to the water. Obviously, your trees they're slowing the the rate of erosion on the sides of the banks. Um, decreasing that amount of silt that's moving to the water. So they're really, really important, um, you know, ecosystem services that they're providing um, for our aquatic habitats. So purple rocket on the left, um, early summer short bloomer, not often seen very often. In the middle, orange jewelweed. Um, most of you, you might know this already, but they have kind of like a jello-like sap that is supposed to be the antidote and the soothing skin irritant to poison ivy um, and stinging nettle, both. Uh, orange, the orange flowers that it has glisten in the sunshine, hence the name um, jewelweed. And they're part of the impatience family. And if you're a botanist, you can kind of tell the leaf, the leaf um, shape um, reminds us of uh, impatience. 
And then cardinal flower, of course, on the right hand side, uh, late summer bloomer. This picture was taken last year in August. Um, but a hummingbird, a swallowtail, a tractor uh, doesn't have a high wildlife value, but beautiful nonetheless. Um, we've got blue vervain on the left hand side. Um, these, this plant bitter to herbivores, so it doesn't really get uh, eaten too often by our mammalian or herbi herbis herbivores. It's very easy to identify because these spikes, the purple spikes, are kind of the only one in that particular color. Middle sneezeweed, contrary to its name, does not cause, cause sneezing. Um, it's, pollinate, it's pollinated by insects, not wind. Um, they, they can be poisonous to livestock. So if you find these in your, um, your fields, your pasture, cows, your, your grazers are not gonna be going for a sneezeweed here. But I saw this on the side of stream. Um, and then last on the right-hand side, we've got obedient plants, um, often grown in flower gardens. Um, it's called obedient plant because if you move the flowers around, they stay where you move them to, hence the name obedient. Um, <clears throat> so that a really, really beautiful plant. It had a humongous colony near where I was kayaking that day. Monkey flower um, on the left-hand side. Um, tons of caterpillars, moths, and butterflies use this as a, a, a feeding, especially like the buckeye um, butterfly uses feeds on this plant, so kind of a cool um, plant. Moving into our woody species, button bush, a shrub, a pretty large shrub, super fragrant flowers, super cool looking flowers. Um, the seed heads in the fall are red. Um, and the ducks and the birds, they are definitely, uh, they love um, eating the seeds of a button bush. And then, you know, everybody knows a sycamore, but we've got our tree species that can be found along the banks. We've got sycamore, cottonwood, box elder, willow, all those trees that are, are providing shade and, and erosion control on the banks of all of our um, streams. Geology, rocks and geology. I didn't have a super great picture, but you know the the streams typically are running through um, large uh, bluffs and things like that. So the geology on, on in streams can be fascinating. Um, and who doesn't like to skip skip a rock or two uh, when they're out there on on the water? So next steps. Hopefully you are ready to get out there and see some of these cool things, take pictures, listen for birds. Um, but next steps that you can do um, when you're out there is, is learn more about kayaking, share your kayaking, take a friend with you kayaking. There are volunteers uh, or there are programs out there that need volunteers that might serve limited resource audiences. Some of the research I found um, was, you know, transportation and access to water um, activities is really uh, a barrier for um, limited resource folks out there. They they don't have um, they don't have the access um, or the transportation to get to these places. So take volunteer with those programs. Uh, the American Canoe Association, the ACA, um, offers courses. Um, there are sixty four I think instructors in Missouri and Illinois that I looked up that. Um, hopefully we'll offer courses. So take an, a take an ACA course. Um, you could also volunteer um, with community science programs. And maybe some of you already on this call are part of the Illinois River Watch Network. Maybe some of you have, have um, are monitoring your streams, but the Illinois River uh, Watch Network out of the National Great River Education Center is awesome. The staff, awesome down there. They, um, uh, have a team of volunteers across the state looking at macroinvertebrates that are showing the quality of our streams. They're looking at mussels. Uh, they're looking at chloride levels in our water all around the state. Volunteers are monitoring that. Um, looking at water temperature and looking at plastics um, in our water all around the different states. So becoming involved in community science could help um, with our aquatic ecosystems. And river, river cleanups, so some community service. There are river sweeps that are hosted in lots of our major um, river systems. Um, Living Lands and Water, if you've ever worked with those folks, they're amazing. Um, they're out of the Quad Cities. They've done a lot of Mississippi River cleanups, and I think they've been working on the Ohio River up and down um, those areas. So 
Um, these are just some ideas on what you can do uh, to become more involved in taking care of our um, stream and aquatic ecosystems so that we have places um, that we can kayak forever and ever and our kids and our grandkids and our future generations can, can uh, kayak forever and ever. So that is all I have um, for you today. I have a few minutes um, that I can take some questions. Um, our next webinar, Everyday Environment webinar is um, which, which grass is which animal or excuse me, annual grass ID with Aaron Garrett. That's on July 13th at one o'clock. Um, please take um, a moment to provide us with some feedback about um, this webinar. You can go to the, the website uh, listed in front of you, or you can also scan the QR code um, to work through uh, that evaluation. It just helps us to provide um, great uh, webinars for you and what, and asks, you know, what you might be interested in the future, uh, for future webinars. So I thank you so much for attending today. I have my email address up here. If you have questions, um, that we can't get to today, just feel free to email me.